Welcome to DC to be Revolution. I'm Noah Bowles, and today I'm talking to an inspiring, engaging, wholehearted chiropractor who practices in Austin, Texas. She's been out there for four years since she graduated from chiropractic school in both Brazil and the US, and she specializes in peds, prenatal, and upper cervical. So Dr. Julia Pinkerton, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So you actually have been uh, associating for those four years and you're working under a, an amazing doc who's had a, a ton of associates. So I was hoping that you could talk uh, a little bit about your, uh, uh, your um, experience as an associate and what you were looking for when uh, looking for an associate position and what you'd recommend to other people. So my experience as associate has been amazing, um, but I definitely feel like I put in the work beforehand to find a doc that was amazing to really get the experience that I wanted. Um, so that's really important. And being that like, I went to so many practices while I was in school, I had a really good idea of what I was looking for. And so when the person came along, um, it was easier for me to identify him because I had already seen so many people in so many offices and I had a really good idea of what I wanted in my head. Yeah, so, so when you visited those offices, um, would you just shadow the docs? Would you ask them specific questions? How would you gather the information that you felt was really relevant for you finding the practice you wanted? So the best is to do both, is to shadow them, to hang out with them, see how they practice, um, get a full tour of their office, talk to their staff, and then hopefully get to have lunch with them or something afterwards so you can kind of debrief on what you saw. Because you don't want to be really talking to them a lot when they're seeing patients. Some of them are super open and they're okay with that. Someone wants you to say nothing. It's better to say less while you're in the office. Um, and then to really write down questions and kind of pick the brains of the docs afterwards and be like, hey, I like this, or what is this, or what was going on here? Um, so you can kind of get a complete picture and that way you get to create a relationship with the doctor as well Which is really important afterwards Yeah, I mean what the perfect way to create relationships with all these great doctors regardless of whether you decide to associate with them um, I know that the students one of their big concerns coming out of school is that they don't feel like they know enough And they want to associate with a doc that they feel like they can learn from what do you feel like they should look for in a doc in order to ensure that they're going to really learn a lot while working in that practice? So um, I like this question because I hadn't really thought about this before, but you definitely want a doctor that is open to teach. Um, not only uh, having somebody like it's the greatest of both worlds, like you get a coach and you get a mentor and you get to work at the same time. So you get paid to do get a mentor. So it's awesome. It was per it was exactly what I was looking for. Um, so as far as what you should look for in a doc, you want somebody that's open, uh, good at communicating. Somebody, <clears throat> I think somebody that's well involved with the schools. Because I think if they're involved with the schools, it really shows that they are wanting to teach. Um, I mean, like you should spend as much time as possible with that person to get a feel for them. Um, you have to want to know their technique. You have to like the way they practice because you're going to want to learn all of that to then potentially move forward to, like you said, a partnership or staying on as associate or going out on your own and taking what you learned into a bigger vision of your own practice in the future. Yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, really finding somebody who is uh, a good fit for you or finding uh, a doctor, you know, spending that time with them and figuring out if the, the synergy between the two of you is really going to help them reach their goals and exceed in their practice and then also help you, uh, you know, get better and grow in the ways that you want to grow. Do you feel like that's mainly just through relationship building or is there anything that you can can look for um, to know that you're going to be part of the right practice when you uh, finally do sign on the dotted line? So I visited as every chance I got in school, I was visiting other practices. So I was very much already keeping track of what I liked, what I didn't like, what I wanted in my practice. Um, so then, like I said, when I saw it, I was like, this is as close as I can get to anybody else creating my ideal. Um, and that really helped me do that. Um, 
Yeah, and like I said, if the person is coming to the schools and be open or is teaching in any way, shape, or form, and they don't have any ulterior motives like selling some sort of product, you know that that person is open and willing to teach. Um, potentially somebody that's had past associates and that you can talk to those associates and hear of their experience, I think would be really important as well. Like, I mean, Bart had, I think I'm number 12 or something of his associates. So he has always had that wanting to foster people coming out of school so they could build successful practices. He's at seminars all the time. He's always learning. So I knew, and he speaks, so I knew he wanted to teach. He was on the alumni board at the school. So it's just like his ideals and my ideals really lined up. So if you can find that, I mean, you have to first know what your ideals are and what you like. And then it's once it comes to you, it can become apparent. But I definitely would go out and visit as many practices as possible so you can find that and see that. Yeah, I, I love how um, you really looked for uh, a doc who was out in the community, who was doing a lot, who was involved, who was engaged, because that speaks to uh, their wanting to be engaged with you and wanting to support you and, and help you to grow. Um, and so, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, what your ideal was and that merging with his ideal because you put in the hard work. Can you share a little bit about what you felt was your kind of ideal uh, associate position or practice? My ideal associate position. <clears throat> so for me, it was um, a cash practice, open adjusting, family-based, um, somebody that saw kids. And um, I really was always interested in the upper cervical component, but going through school, as I think most of us think, is like, Either you do upper cervical or full spine, you can't do both, which we do both. Uh, and so that just really fit like every, it checked every box that I was looking for. Um, it's a beautiful practice. Like he's been doing it for 23 years. He was third generation. Um, so man, when he like, and it was so funny cause like he interviewed me for an hour and I interviewed him for two hours. So I was much more diligent. And I think I've talked to you about this much more like, and I'm sure he knew what he was looking for more than I did because he's done this before. And so I was like, I needed to make a hundred percent sure I was moving halfway across the country like that this was going to be it for me. And so I just made sure I was 100% comfortable in that decision. I spent as much time as I could and it, yeah, you have to really, it's like a gut check, a heart check, and then a head check. So like all those checks have to come into alignment. And then of course the financial check as well. That's an important one um, coming out of school because our student loans are pretty hefty. So you have to have something that's going to be able to balance that as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so amazing that you spent two hours interviewing him and he only spent an hour uh, interviewing you. That really uh, speaks to your dedication to really like finding the right fit and really like working through a lot of those details that are important. And I think for, for many students, it's, a, it's kind of the financial and the logistical stuff that uh, is, you know, more complicated to wade through. Do you have any recommendations in terms of what was like the right fit for you financially and the right fit um, for you logistically in terms of the number of hours, the, the commitment, kind of the, the, you know, logistics of the contract that you were looking for? So actually ask, answer me this, how much do you guys get for living expenses a quarter? Like what would you say that number is? Uh, I think it's about $6,000 if you take on uh, like the full amount of loans on top of what you're paying um, for school. So I'd look for something a little bit higher than that um, and try to live in the same means that you've lived on as a student. Like don't be extravagant, like live very minimally for as long as you can so you can build from that. So. I'd say try to maintain the same because I thought, I mean, for students, we lived really well. Like, I don't know how it is now, but like even in the Bay Area, we were living well. And so if you can stay at that level, I think that's a good salary average to think about. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good barometer because then there's not like a huge switch in your lifestyle. You can basically just kind of like maintain and use uh, a lot of the similar budgets and a lot of the, you know, similar things that you've used. That. So it's easy and you can save at that level potentially as well because you should be getting that and a bonus on top of that for whatever you bring in. That's pretty standard. And so whatever you bring in more than that, like start socking that away into savings as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and so, you know, do you have a particular situation where you are going through different phases? Is there kind of like you're, you know, it seems like at four years you're through the hiring phase, you've been fully hired. Are you in kind of a tandem phase? And is there any uh, talk about maybe you taking over the practice sometime or what would you recommend in terms of that? So there was definitely, I mean, it all depends on what you want. Um, so there was always the thought, so I was supposed to come on as a partner. Like that was always our idea. Um, I actually recently this past year backed out from that um, for multiple different reasons. Um, and so I definitely feel like if you're going into that, ideally if it works out, you should look to grow in that relationship. Like are you going to be a partner? Are you going to buy in? Like where can you go forward from that? Or it's going to stagnate to some degree and you're going to want to move on, which is kind of the situation where I've kind of found myself, which I might open another practice for him. I might um, take a step back for a little bit. Like I haven't really decided yet, but all of a sudden, like, I don't know, things shifted for me and I decided to take a step back from that. Um, so, but I definitely feel like you should go into it being like, hey, there's potential for me to grow from here if you want to. Um, it's just like the relationship will never go anywhere if you don't have that potential for a future growth within that. Like there should be a ladder that you can climb. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, it feels to me like the story I keep hearing from other students is I want to associate for a couple of years and then open my own practice, which right. really doesn't give you any upward growth in that practice that you're working in. It's basically like you're using them as a mentor and then you go off and you kind of do your own thing. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's what most students seem to think is the best scenario, but you're proposing something very different where you're actually like becoming a partner or perhaps like eventually buying the practice or, you know, uh, creating a lot of upward mobility within that particular position. Right. And we've actually already, I mean, we're looking at creating multiple practices and kind of having a joint core group of where he's, and I mean, he's trained so many associates um, of him potentially financing the people that he trains in his office into their own offices. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we brought up here in Austin is um, we've got another doc in training right now and we're going to place him in an office in uh, a location north of here. And so working on how to, I feel like we need to work more together and less of the lone wolf mentality. And even if you're just sharing space with somebody like, the fact that we have practices that are only open 20 hours a week, I find ridiculous. Like, why do you have a space that's not being used for the rest of that time? So I feel like joint practices is really where we need to move towards as a profession. Um, and how do we get there? And how do we work together more? Um, so we're trying to figure that out and wage that out. And I think we're, I'm on the alumni board at school and we're trying to mentor more people as well. And how do we further this and how do we become more together than doing that whole like, hey, just go out and be on your own and do your own thing and you're off in the world. Like, let's be together. Like, let's be smarter about this. Like dentists are doing partner practices. Lawyers do it. Um, accountants do it. Like, why aren't we doing more of that as well? And share the overhead. Yeah, right. I mean, the that makes total sense to me. And I, I think there is kind of this um, feeling for uh, a lot of people in chiropractic that there is some divisiveness and that, you know, not everybody is willing to work together, but what a, a perfect way to work together, especially like, let's say you're an upper cervical doc, you could work with this full spine doc. And yeah. you know, I mean, it, there's just so many opportunities for collaboration and working together and growing and learning, right? And when you're yeah. in that environment with other people, there's so much that they can teach you. I mean, definitely. Just, just makes and we sense. have three doctors in our practice that are working in our, so there's our main doc, me, and then we have a new associate. 
And then we have three independent contractors that come in and use our space right now as well because we have a massive space. And like, I just really feel like that's where we need to go more towards, um, especially, I don't know, I feel like the student loans that we're coming up against, it's like it's going to be a major crisis for us and we've got to find ways to um, divide our expenses so we can really grow and go forward. So I feel like there's a ridiculous statistic that 50% of the people coming out of chiropractic school don't practice chiropractic. And I feel like that's because they go out and they're alone and they it's too much expense and they just like flop and they end up giving up. And I feel like if we came together more and did more joint practices, it would really help people and foster more of these relationships and conversations. Um, like, hey, I had this hard patient, like what would you do, like type of thing which I think we lose after school, and I miss the chiropractic bubble, man. That's why I go back to seminars, like, oh, my gosh, it's so good and warm and nice. So. It is. It's such a great bubble. And, and I love this, uh, this joint practice proposition that you're, you're mentioning here because I feel like uh, students want to stay in the bubble, and they think the only way to stay in the bubble is to become an associate. Um, but what you're uh, putting out there is that, no, there's a lot of other ways to stay in the bubble. And really the intention of working alongside other chiropractors and being in a joint practice and collaborating together is, is really the intention that we're all trying to cultivate with considering being an associate, because you can still have that mentorship within that uh, kind of uh, container. Which I don't, deny that having somebody that has experience in the field is good to go through first. Like we used to have this huge apprenticeship type of society. And I feel like in the last hundred or so years, like we've lost that, like we need to have somebody that kind of takes us through and holds it. Like I still feel like I reach out to my boss and I'm like, Oh my God, hold my hand through this. Like it happens less and less, but having that there is so nice to be able to bounce ideas off of. Um, and once you have that security, um, creating like some sort of partnership and maybe it's you're just sharing space and sharing expenses maybe you actually create a practice together but you don't need to be say for example married as um, chiropractors to have that I feel like there's definitely other ways that we could be doing it effectively yeah I appreciate that that um, innovative spirit and that spirit of, of trying new new solutions or finding a solution that works for both parties and is you know a win-win for for both right. people involved because um, I feel like sometimes those associate positions can be uh, kind of a win-lose proposition for the, the mentoring doctor, especially if the associate just wants to leave after a couple of years. Right. And, you know, they say, you know, the first year, like you're that associate, you're spending money on them and you're spending time. The second year you break even. The third year is only when they start to make money off the associate. And I feel like we forget about that going into the practice. So actually, you're costing the doctor to be there. Um, and people come in with a big chip on their shoulder, and I feel like there's just a lot of bad energy around the whole thing, and I think it just really needs to be re-looked at, and everybody needs their mind opened on it a lot. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a perfect segue, because I feel like there is a certain amount of entitlement when you go to associate practice. So what does it take to be an all-star associate? What does it take to be like the associate that every doctor is gonna want? So it's funny, so I like this question as well. So I feel like it's the same thing that you should be doing in school. You should be dedicated, you should be learning, you should be driven, you should be um, showing up on time or early. Like you should be learning as much as you can for them um, and creating innovative, creative ways of how you can use your passions to draw in new patients. Like, um, cause I mean, the, and that's how they drive you is usually through the bonuses of the people that you bring in. Um, like I feel like I, I keep my own stats, like we have office stats and then I pattern my stats off the office stats and I make goals for the future year so I can track what I did last year and how I can grow that even more this year and I can see um, like where I need to vamp up like my efforts and marketing and like track what I did that was good for me, what wasn't good. Um, I usually, like I feel like, and it's different, I feel like guys do really well with metrics. Women are more about feelings and how you feel about things. So I go much more like I see those metrics and they're there and they're good, but I go much more on like what feeds my energy and what makes me feel good. Um, so I try to balance that out and do both of them um, because I think they are both important. 
Yeah, they, I I agree. I, it's kind of like the yin and yang. Like you need the the hard data, but at the same time, like you can have all the hard data in the world, and if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel good, then it's going to be hard to sustain your energy to be able to you know do that day in and day out, even if the metrics tell you that you're doing everything right. So. Yeah, and some people numbers really drive them. Like I look at those numbers, they don't really drive me. It's more about how do I attain the feeling that I want to achieve. Um, and how do I feel energetic and what doesn't drain me and what gives me energy. Um, and so those things are really, really important to me. Yeah. So important as I, you know, I definitely know that for being in school, it's really important to, to put myself first and school has to go second. Otherwise I just don't have the energy to maintain. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, this has been, uh, an amazing interview. I, I know that, um, chiropractors, students, people are gonna have questions. What is the best way for them to get in touch with you, reach out to you, learn more about what you're doing and all the different innovations that you're contributing to the chiropractic community? Um, so I am on Facebook. That's probably gonna be the best way. Um, other than Facebook, definitely email. My um, email address is juliapinkertondc at gmail.com. You can reach me there. Um, our website is austinlifechiro.com, so you can see our website there. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. That's not as the best as, like, you can see some stuff, but I'm not really on there as much, so the other two um, will be the best way to reach in touch with me. Perfect. Well, I will uh, put those links at the, the bottom of the, the YouTube comments so that people who want to check out the website, want to uh, reach out to you on Facebook, they can do that. So, um, yeah. Thanks for being part of DC to be revolution. Um, and hopefully uh, people got a lot of value. If you got value out of this video, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, uh, leave some comments, always happy to uh, help people find the answers that they're looking for. And um, yeah, thanks again, Dr. Julia Pinkerton. Thank you and thank for all that you do, Noah, it's awesome. Yeah, my pleasure.